Okay, thank you. Anyone who needs a handout, uh, sort of an overview of what I'm talking about, uh, they will be down here. And for any students who are here who haven't signed in, the sign-up sheet is right there. Uh, what I want to do today, first of all, is thank everyone for coming. Can you hear me? Uh, it's on, but you can't hear me. Now you can hear me. Okay, I have sort of have to get close. Okay, I want to thank everyone for coming. Uh, this topic, uh, East German Intellectuals and the Unification of Germany, is a very broad one, and it's also a quite narrow one. So I want to give you an introduction and an overview, because most Americans think, oh, well, the Berlin Wall came down on November 9th, 1989. Most people who are over 50 can remember what they were doing when they heard it. You probably heard it on CNN News or, or NPR the morning of November 10th, as I did, and I can still remember where I was and what I was doing, okay? Getting a couple kids ready for school or stuff like that. And, um, but I can clearly remember where I was, one of those events. So let me give you this overview. I'm going to read a little bit from the preface of the book, and the book will be coming out. Well, I got an email this morning from the publisher saying, uh, we're doing the final revisions on your galley proofs, and we're going to send it to the printer. So they still haven't given me the publication date, but it'll be sometime in the new year coming out to uh, Palgrave Macmillan. All right. So, Introduction. Uh, the geopolitical level in 1989, as many of you know, there was a great deal of uh, upheaval, geopolitical upheaval in the world. The Cold War was coming to an end. And although the Bush administration didn't really anticipate this, and no one in the West, well, a few did, but not many, anticipated it, that was going on. So what was the, the spirit of the time, the zeitgeist, as the Germans say? It was the Cold War good guys versus bad guys. But it depended on, on which side of the Iron Curtain you were on. If you were on one side, you were good, and the other side, evil. So that's the geopolitical level. The interesting thing, or one interesting thing about Germany was there was a divide that had taken place after the Second World War. There were two Germanys. East Germany, socialist, dominated by the Soviets. West Germany, capitalist and dominated, frankly, by the Americans, okay? So they were separated for 45 years, and then suddenly on November 9th, 1989, that began to come to an end, and it culminated on October 3rd, 1990, when there was an official unification of Germany. Um, the next level would be the institutional level and the identity of people level, and that's what the book is about because it's an ethnography, um, and that is about, my focus was, because no one else was studying this, quite to my amazement, when I was there in Germany, I happened to be in Germany uh, in, in 1990, as the unification was taking place, um, I wanted to know, I'd always been inter interested in intellectuals, and I'd always been interested in organizational decline. What do people do when their organizations are declining? How do they respond to that? Do they leave? Do they stay? Do they try to repair it? What do they do? So this was a case of the decline of the entire East German society, which I didn't know about until I got there and got into East Germany. But we'll, we'll come back to that. So I wanted to know the reactions of East Germany's intellectual class to the unification, all right? And I got there five weeks before unification took place. Specifically, I wanted to know how national, that is, as a citizen of East Germany, and cultural or ideological identity were going to be affected by the merger of the two German states. Another interest that sociologists have, quite naturally, and political scientists, is how does power work in society? So I wanted to know under what conditions would the unification of Germany, how would power be exercised to bring this about? So quickly, November 9th, 1989, the wall opens. There's euphoria throughout Germany, especially in East Germany. And during the, the summer and fall, and fall of 1989, as some of you will remember, 
there were weekly demonstrations in Leipzig. Does anybody remember that? No? Okay. Well, there were. And they were covered by CNN um, and other news media. And those demonstrations became bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, this was an expression of the great dissatisfaction with the way the Socialist Party had been ruling the country since 1945. Right? Um, so there was a group called Neues Forum. Maybe some of you have heard of that, maybe not. But there were these movement groups. They wanted to reform East Germany. They didn't want to abandon socialism. They basically wanted to abandon the Socialist Party and create a new, what they called, a third way. I know there's third way here in the West, that's Tony Blair and Bill Clinton, not that third way. This was a socialist third way. So there was this great euphoria. Um, only a few Germans at that time understood that the opening of the wall on November 9th was the beginning of the end of East Germany. Most thought it was the opportunity they had been waiting for for many years of their entire lifetime to reform the East German state. Um, so from November of 89 to March 1st of 1990, German intellectuals engaged in roundtable discussions. And these were an expression, they thought, of grassroots democracy and organization. The major question was, what can we do with our country now? It's our country. What can we do? We're socialists. The West Germans are our cousins, but they're capitalists. What are we going to do? Simultaneously, of course, going on, there were the actions of the West German government. Helmut Kohl was the chancellor, and he was pushing for rapid and immediate unification. Um, the, the people, most of the people attending the round tables were in favor of a vote to decide on unification. A few said, don't do this, it will be the end of East Germany. They were outnumbered, so a vote was held on March 1st. And overwhelmingly, the East German people voted to abandon East Germany, to abandon socialism, and to merge with West Germany. The intellectual class voted overwhelmingly against unification because they knew if there's a unification, who needs East German intellectuals? Right? Because most of them are communists. So, that's what happened. Um, the GDR workers, however, as I said, voted overwhelmingly because they, I heard this over and over again, they had seen an image of West Germany and America on German television. Most people in East Germany could, could watch German tele, West German television. There were some areas that were blacked out. There's even an area in Germany, in, around Dresden. And to this day, the people are slightly more communistic and socialistic in their orientation because they never saw Western television. So that seems to prove the case. At any rate, immediately upon the vote for unification, there were still several months before October 3rd, 1990, when it would become official. But once that vote was taken, the dismantling of East Germany began in earnest by the, by the West Germans. Um, so, unification translated into the takeover of East Germany by West Germany. This meant the elimination of all East German institutions because they were all based in socialism, okay? Uh, the intellectual class of East Germany had to be stripped of its institutional power. So there was an academy of science, there were many universities, especially Humboldt University, in, which is the flagship university of Germany, which was in East Berlin. Radio, television, other media, all those people had to be dealt with by the, East Germ by the West Germans. So let me pause here to say, ideally, the role of an intellectual in a society, at least what we're taught, is the role of an intellectual is to contribute to the culture, to be a critic of society, to improve it, uh, not to be just a critic, but to engage in critique to make society better. That's the idealized version of the role. But we do know that in many instances, people who actually do that can pay a very heavy toll if they do that wholeheartedly. 
because as one East German said to me, in the end, all intellectuals are dependent upon the state they live in for their bread and butter. And that is a very strong incentive to conform, even if you're being critical. So, and, and that's that's I'm talking about scientists, artists. I interviewed, uh, since you asked the question now, I'll answer it now. I interviewed over 100 people. I sampled as best I could from sociology, economics, history, chemistry, physics, biology, medicine. I also talked to people in the theater, uh, people in philosophy, administrators at Humboldt University, and people in radio, television, and newsprint. So there are two definitions of intellectual. One is people who think a lot about society. That's one definition. And the other definition is somebody who has a job in one of those fields or others that I just mentioned. I said, because this is an ethnography, I can't be choosy. I'm, I'm going to talk to people who fit both those categories. However, most of them fit the category of this is what they were doing. They were being paid to contribute scientifically, artistically to the culture. Okay? All right. Um, so, the West German just justification for dismantling, and the, and the East Germans have a special word for this. They call it Abwicklung. Entwicklung means development. Abwicklung is the opposite of development. And they translate it in numerous ways. Unwinding, winding down, dismantling, liquidating. But if you say liquidating to a German, they say, you mean they tried to turn us into water? You know, so it's hard to translate, but it means it's the term the East Germans settled on, Abwicklung of East Germany, the winding down, the dismantling of the East German, of all East German institutions. So the West German justification for this was, first, there never was an East German state. And officially, there never was an East German state. It was, if some of you remember Willy Brandt, I'm sure some of you will all give away our age, right? I was a child, when, <laughs> but some of you remember Willy Brandt, the mayor of West Berlin. And he came up with the concept of Ostpolitik because the official position of the West German government in the 50s and into the 60s was there is no East German state, just like we didn't recognize China for all those years. But that presented a real problem because two-thirds of the people living in East Germany had relatives in the West. And there was still, even though the wall went up, and before the wall went up, you could just walk across the street and be in the other country. Want to leave East Germany, just walk across the street. So, Ostpolitik meant a recognition that there is a German state there, but that it is an illegitimate German state because it's dominated by the communists, the Soviets. Of course, what the West Germans didn't admit is who was dominating them. Us. <laughs> When you go to Berlin, you see America everywhere, okay? Uh, but when you're living in the culture, you don't think of that. So the justification was we must dismantle East Germany because really the East Germans are like feral children, prodigal sons, uh, or communist apologists, but they're really not they're incompletely socialized. They've been dominated by the, the Stasi, the secret police, by the Socialist Party. They're defective Germans. They spent 45 years going in the wrong direction. Now we have to re-socialize them. So that was the major justification. Therefore, nothing about East German institutions was allowed to come into the new Germany. And this is a point the East Germans stressed to me over and over again. Nothing. Have any of you been to Germany? So yes, so some of you know Ampelmann, you know, the, the light signal, when, when the light turns green, there's this man who walks across the, and his hat goes like this. That's from East Germany, because the West German Ampelmann was very boring, but the East German one is quite, quite good. You know, Disney Studios or, or could have done it, or Warner Brothers and the Bugs Bunny era could have, could have designed it. So that was, that's the only thing East German officially that's been incorporated by the West Germans. Um, so, 
this is what went on. And, and so, because one system was capitalist, one system was socialist, many, many things had to change. East Germans had to find a job, not be given a job, trained and given a job. They had to buy car insurance, health insurance, many things that they had never worried about before or they had worried about in a different way, they had to now do because they were living in a capitalist system. So, um, and if, turning specifically back to the intellectuals, an evaluation of the East German Academy of Sciences, the universities, the media was undertaken. And the policy was, it was undertaken by West Germans of East Germans. And the policy was, two thirds of all these people will be dismissed. That was just, and, and the justification was twofold. One, we don't, there's duplication. We don't have enough money to employ all these East Germans. There's lots of duplication with West Germans. And it was taken for granted that no West German was gonna be evaluated and lose their job. It would be the East Germans. The other one was the Soviets still had troops stationed in East Germany right through the unification. And the West German government said, oh, uh, Gorbachev might decide to send the troops out of the barracks and, re and impose martial law and retake East Germany. We now know this was pure nonsense. This was not going to happen because, in fact, Gorbachev was negotiating with Bush uh, about what to do about NATO and all these things we, we needn't go into. So that's, that's what happened. Um, it's indisputable that East Germany was swallowed up, absorbed, taken over by West Germany. The West Germans paid no attention to issues of identity, that is identity not just as a socialist, but as an East German. So when I went back in 2014 and talked to about one fourth of the Germans, East Germans I had talked with in 1990, uh, they would say things like, I'm, I'm a former citizen of East Germany, now residing in the Bundesrepublik. That means unified Germany. That's how they thought of themselves. But these issues, if you think back to 1990, communism was pronounced dead. So some of you know this term, the end of history. Yes, some of you know this? A book written, all right. At the time, and, that, and the first article, The End of History, was written in May, published in May of 1989. And so by the end of 1989, with the Berlin Wall open, it seemed like a reasonable thing to entertain. The end of history, and that means, the end of history means communism is dead, capitalism is the way all social problems will be dealt with. The market will, will solve all problems. And we're still living with that today uh, 20, 26 years later. All right, so how did the int intellectuals, the intelligentsia of the GDR view what was happening to them? I had dozens of informal conversations and over 100 interviews. Uh, with one or two exceptions, they all said the same thing. We are being colonized by the West Germans, our cousins, because they've learned to be capitalists and that's what capitalists do. The, 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 sort of the street way of saying we're being colonized is they want to make a buck off of us, okay? And, the, and that's what they want to do. That was the view of the East Germans. Um, so let me tell you how the book is organized and then I'd like to open it up for questions. Uh, first, there's an introduction where I talk about how it was, because it was serendipitous. I didn't go to Germany to study East Germans. I went there to study how computers were affecting organizations, because personal computers were just becoming widespread in 1990 in organizations. Uh, so that's the introduction. The f part one is the meat of the book. It's about 150 pages, and that's the interviews I did with these East Germans. And I let them have their voice because no one else was giving it to them. And by the way, no publisher wanted this book 25 years ago. And now, when I tried to get it published again three years ago, I had nearly a dozen who wanted express some interest in it. So I'm very fortunate in that regard. But it's really a matter of timing, right? A quarter century goes by and suddenly they say, we really should have talked to those people 
you know? And I remember telling at least one of them who became a friend of mine, I said to her, she said, we're, we're a page being torn from the book. And I said, they can't do that. They can do it now, but it won't last. So that's really the meat of the book. I don't do any analysis in it. I talk to them. I ask them questions. Um, and then the next part of the book is the return in July of 2014. And I've talked with about 28 of them, about one-fourth of them, and said, all right, you've been living in this system, this capitalist system. What do you make of it? So and basically, in their hearts, they're still socialist. They have learned to be capitalists because they have to survive. And none of them that I talked to wanted to go back to East Germany, but they all loved the identity they had as East Germans. And they missed that. I said, I asked, how often do you think about this? And every one of them said, oh, three, four, five times a week. And they all said, it's not that I want to go back. I don't. But it was so different from the domination of the party and from the way the West is. And they, they feel now that West Germany is basically, to them, it's an authoritarian society. They say it's presented differently than the East German society was. East German society was absolutely and brutally and in your face authoritarian, and they say West Germany is quite different. Okay. And so they asked me questions about the CIA spying on them, because remember when I went back there, it had just been revealed that Angela Merkel's cell phone was invaded by our government, okay? So this issue, my wife and I were on the train going to Potsdam, and uh, some German fellow, he heard us talking. He started talking to us, which typically Germans don't talk to strangers. He said, oh, you Americans, you know, and remember we had that conversation? And it was uh, quite interesting. So that's the second part. The third part is an analysis. It says, all right, how can we make sense sociologically of what happened? I take three points of view. Some of you may know um, A.O. Hirschman, Exit Voice and Loyalty, that book. I talk about that, the, dy the dynamics of why the GDR fell as it did. But then I talk about a sociologist named Pierre Bourdieu, who, who's basically sort of a modified Marxist, uh, who talks about the use of power. And actually, his model explains quite well why the West Germans treated the East Germans the way they did. Because when somebody new comes into your society, it's like somebody new coming into a sports locker room when the rookies come. What do you do with the rookies? You taunt them and tease them and make them buy you donuts, right? You put shoe polish on the telephone receiver, all kinds of goofy things. All right, you initiate them. And the East Germans had to pay a price for losing the Cold War. Okay. So that explains that. And then I talk about stigma with the work of someone named Irving Goffman, who some of you may know about, because Bourdieu viewed Goffman's work as the complement to his. Like, when you do that to someone, you have to stigmatize them. And then I write an epilogue where I just sum up and say that if there's anything to say in an epilogue, it's that the West Germans should really think about the fact that the question of East German identity has not been settled because they're still writing articles contemporaneously in, e in West Germany saying, these East Germans have to give up this identity. Okay, so, and then I write some methodological notes, which I think I've addressed the main part for you here with how, uh, how I came to be there, uh, the sampling techniques one uses uh, when doing an ethnography, and the special conditions of the time. No, I did not use tape recorders uh, because I think many of them would have given me erroneous answers uh, because I arrived five weeks before unification. A few of them at first thought, oh, he's been sent here by the West Germans or the CIA to see how we're going to react to unification, what we might do to resist it. But I won't go into the details unless someone asks me a question now. Um, that obstacle was overcome quite quickly, okay? So let's open it up for questions now. We've got about 30 minutes. I hope there are some questions. 
Uh, there are a lot of ways to go with this. Yes? Uh, I'm interested. How did you get permission to talk to those people? And how well, did you find those particular people? Well, I didn't need permission uh, because this was the limbo period. And it was the East German government was basically kaput. It was finished, but still officially in existence. So all the old controls in, in the old days, if a foreigner came into the GDR, especially an American, no one was allowed to speak to them. If you spoke to an American without permission, you would be in trouble. So how did I get there? Uh, I was staying, my family and I were staying with some friends because we had to get there early because their school starts in the third week of August, not in September, but our apartment wasn't available until the first of September because it was an academic calendar. So we spent two weeks with colleagues who were, an Amer who were Americans who live and work in Berlin. And the first night there, we were at dinner, the colleague got a call, and he said, oh, this calls for you, to me. And I'm, he's, he's kind of a jokester. So he put me on the phone, and this German fellow says, thank you very much for agreeing to come and talk to our class. <laughs> I said, okay. And then this was in East Berlin, and it was a language class at the Academy of Sciences, and I went. I actually thought they were students, because academy, you know, I thought, oh, it's students. And it was scientists studying English, and they'd never heard a native speaker of English. And they asked me to talk about American Indians. So that's how I got there. And then from there, it, it, uh, I, I went around trying to find, well, there must be, you know, there are lots of Americans here attached to institutes. I'm going to find the guys who are studying these people. And I quickly learned that there was nobody studying them because most West Germans regarded them as the flotsam and jetsam of history, or what that Trotsky quote, which I can't think of, history scrap heap. Is that the right, right one? They're on the, they're on the scrap heap of history. And I just knew, because I had an interest in intellectuals, I just knew that um, someday this was going to be important. So I started. I went to the Social Science Center and I said, you know, this project, I didn't start this project about organizations and computers. I want to do this. And he said, oh, do that. We can't talk to the East Germans. Do that. So that's what I did. Yes. Right. No. No, I, I suspect that the book will put me in touch with some of them, but this raises a point. There is, I talked with German academics at that time. One became a friend of mine, um, very, very nice man. Um, we met in, in the kinder, Kinderladen, both our sons <laughs> were in there, and he's still helpful and, and a friend to this day. Um, he put me in touch with numerous people. Most of them, not all, most of them, were livid about the fact that I would waste my time studying these East Germans. One, he was in charge of dispersing the money, Social Science Research Council money, because I was going to try and stay on a second year, and he said, oh, go talk to this guy. And the first thing he said to me, he said, why do you want to talk to these people? They're nothing. They're defeated. And it went downhill from there, uh, as if it could get lower than that. Uh, and then I went to talk to a sociologist who said nothing sociological, but spent 35 minutes ranting and raving about those communists and we're going to fix them. Um, so, the, especially in Berlin, the rivalry was intense. Okay. Yeah. Yes, Mary. Did I hear you correctly that the East German government didn't seem to care very much about finding jobs and follow-up questions uh, for the East Germans? They were not capable. They wanted to find jobs for themselves because the East German government basically collapsed. The reason the wall was open was they thought there's so much protest going on in the country. There had been 500,000 people in the streets of Berlin three days earlier, and they thought, okay, we'll, we'll give the people a three-day weekend. They can go Friday, Saturday, and Sunday to the West, to West Germany or to West Berlin, and then they'll come back Monday and go back to work. That's what they thought when they said, we'll open the wall. And of course, that didn't happen. 
So once the vote was held and it was clear, uh, they were economically bankrupt also. So it was clear that the East German government was coming to an end. The East Germans, and then there were revelations about who had been spying on who. Um, so there were 26,000 people at the Academy of Sciences. There was no way they would all be reemployed, okay? But to arbitrarily say only one third of them will be taken was not correct. And, and that was done, not on the basis, there were valuations done, but th those were cosmetic. The, the way people survived was they knew somebody. And it might be legitimate, you might be a historian who knew someone in West Germany, but that's, that, so chaos ensued in the East German government after the March vote, and the government basically w disappeared. Yeah. Okay, so I'm glad you asked. It depends. If they were committed socialist, they were on the blacklist, which was not written down anywhere, but the mental blacklist. Uh, many people in medicine, physics, etc., emigrated from the GDR because one of the things one had to do to be, to be given, to be one of the chosen one-third to be given a contract, and by the way, the people who were given contracts to continue their work they were two to three year contracts. So one person I interviewed at Potsdam University, she said, there were 230 of us when we came here in 1992, there are 34 of us left. She said, most of them have not been renewed. So many people immigrated. The, the unwritten criteria were, you, have, you must in some way, as one put it, bow your head and renounce socialism or not be not continue to say, I am a committed socialist. Also, if you were accused of collaborating with the Stasi, that automatically, a letter would be placed in your file, you would automatically be barred from any work that was supported by the government. So what happened to those people back then? Uh, the two-thirds. First, I didn't find any of the two-thirds because most of them were gone. They emigrated, they became taxi cab drivers, a lot of them went into businesses because a lot of businesses, capitalism came to Eastern Germany. So people who were good in uh, speaking skills, good at the language, because it's a difficult language, right? Getting the cases and all that to speak proper German is, it, it takes a, a lot of training, right? To speak it properly. Um, and so they went into insurance, business management, a lot of the academics they got jobs in science. One of my friends, he was a chemist, and he was let go because his, his, his area was told, you must cut 50% of your people, the other 50% will be kept on, and he, he was told, you're being let go because you're 22 years old. You'll find your way. These other guys, there was also age bias. Anyone who was over 40 was basically told by the review panels, you're not going to be rehired because you're over 40. Okay. So there are all these filters in place to, uh, to do that. Uh, the, the Germans call it vitamin B. If you have vitamin B, and we call it the old boy network, right? Same thing. If you're connected to a network, then you were, uh, your Stasi connections could be whitewashed, etc. cetera. And, and speaking of the Stasi, Almost anyone could be accused because what happened was when academics traveled and they came out of the country and they came back, they had to sit down with the Stasi and be debriefed. They would take notes and the notes would go in your file. That could be grounds for collaboration. And so I asked them, who should deal with this Stasi issue? And they said, we, we East Germans. And the West Germans say, oh no, they'll whitewash. And the East Germans say, no, actually the West Germans whitewashed because, and they could point to people at Humboldt or at the academy who basically became a model West German. You know, like there's no anti-communist like a former communist, you know this, all right? Same thing, same thing here. Okay, yes.
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, yes. L let me touch on that. I, I felt bad after I reread it because I said that to you because I want to talk about the East Germans, but there are some striking parallels which I just want to mention. First of all, an election was held in East Germany in the spring of 1989. These were local elections. And there was actually some freedom in the local elections. And all the people were convinced that these elections were what? What are we talking about now to some extent? In this? They were rigged. Okay. This was like a final straw because it was a final safety valve for the people who were pushing for reform of the country. So you have a situation, and remember, the East German Communist Party was dominated by people who had fought Stalin. So these people were entering their 70s and 80s in 1989. And they were set in their ways. And they were quite dogmatic. I interviewed a Stasi agent, and he said, there was no pressure relief valve. So you had this election, which might have been a pressure relief valve. Um, Initial attempts to repress the demonstrations in Leipzig in the fall that didn't work. Attempts to repress them when they spread to Berlin that didn't work. And then finally the party at the very end said, we've got to do something. And of course by then, when you give a little bit, what happens? The dam breaks, right? So the parallels to the United States are about the delegitimization of the government. So now we have the Green Party. I assume most of you know what I'm talking about contesting elections, uh, wanting recounts in M Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin, and people are saying, why is the Green Party doing this? There's no evidence, but more beyond that, why are they doing this? Because if Hillary would win those states, she'd be president, right? So what's going on? And there's a lot of uncertainty about what people's motivations are. But the main thing about East Germany at that time was the delegitimization of the government. And Almost to a person, the people I spoke to, I can think of only three or four, who still believed in the East German government. There were lots of committed communists. As one said to me, and he was a very famous academic who never got a, a job in Germany. He's had a separate career being consultant and being invited to speak all around the world. He said, um, I didn't think the party could get everything wrong, but I was wrong. Yes. The Russians, well, you, we, okay. Hungary had already separated from the Soviet Union. Ceausescu, courtesy of CNN, we saw him executed on TV, right? Some of you remember that. Uh, the Czech Republic. So the dominoes were falling. And the Soviets had absolutely no interest. The, the Iron Curtain was coming down. And as I said, Gorbachev was talking with Bush about the post-Warsaw Pact, the post, what he hoped would be the post-NATO era. Um, it was, as far as the Russians were concerned, it was an internal matter among the Germans. That's all it was. Yeah. Anyone else? Yes. Yes. Yes, there were some college age. She, she asked, when I walked into the room, I thought I was going into to the academy, which meant college students. So the age range in there was from about 20 to 65. Okay? It was because the academy had full members, not that many of, of them, and then all the way down to what we would term graduate assistants or graduate students. Okay? So that's what was in that classroom. Most of the people were in, were in middle age, 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. A few very young ones and a few uh, old ones because if they were retired, they wouldn't be there because they wouldn't be working at the academy anymore. Okay? okay. Uh, fearful? Uh, well, of what?
No, the, the, the mood in, in Germany at that time, I know what you mean. I suppose, well, I went through East Germany a year earlier, and uh, I went through a place called Friedrichstrasse, which is where people going, I was going to Budapest, um, and that was frightening because of the crush of people. Because I had two small children, my wife, and we had all this luggage, and I had most of it, <laughs> and, uh, and there were people pushing and pushing. Uh, actually, when the German guards with their dogs learned that we were Americans, they actually gave us preferential treatment, which was very embarrassing to me. Oh, Americana Chapas is good. Come, come. So that's what happened, okay? Now, this was a year before, but I suppose I, inter I actually interviewed an East German guard, so I understand now there were people too. In fact, the East German guard I met was a very smart, very intelligent, very gentle man. I saw him with his children. Um, so once I got there in August of 1990, no. Uh, there were some areas where one didn't want to walk at night because the prostitutes had appeared with their pimps and the, and the drugs. And this is something that really shocked these Germans. Uh, oh, well, they, they never had street prostitutes or drugs. Uh, many women told me, I, I, I walk around, I would walk around at night, no problem. One said, well, some guy tried to attack me once, all I had to do was scream, and all these people come pouring out of their apartments, and they, they captured him. Where were you going to go? It was a police state, right? So, and West, West Berlin was the same way, because it was surrounded by East Berlin, very crime-free, because where were you going to escape to? You were walled in. Okay, so no, I didn't feel uh, any fear, and there was only, like in this class I entered, and I, I ended up participating in three language classes that fall. This one just the one time, then there were three more that fall that I participated in. There were always two or three people, class of 30, two or three people who absolutely refused to acknowledge my existence. I was a, you know what, um, an effing American, and they were gonna let me know that they knew what I was really there for. But the rest of them, they were dying to talk to someone. They said, we're tired of talking to each other. We cannot talk to the West Germans. We just want you to shut up and listen to us. So a lot of my interviews, I had a, a formal questionnaire, a structured questionnaire to begin with. That didn't work. Uh, and then my friend, this sociologist I mentioned earlier, he said, oh, you need to read the book called The Questionnaire. Because after the First, Second World War, the Allies wrote a questionnaire to denazify Germany. And the Germans loathed the questionnaire. It was a six-page questionnaire. And so someone wrote a book about Der Fragebogen, the questionnaire, to ridicule this. And he said, that's what you're getting. And they said to me, we're not zoo animals. Some of these people come around and interview us. They treat us like zoo animals. We just want to talk. So I got all my questions answered, but in every interview, I had to let them go first because they had stuff, and they did. They were in a state of chaos and turmoil. So it was more, yes? I had heard that the uh, decision to open the wall came from the border guard level. That is, they opened the gates to kind of relieve the pressure on the crowd. Uh, that's... And in part, that's true, but go ahead. Well, they were trying to get in touch with the supervisors. Yes, yes. They weren't getting any feedback. They were arguing yes. on the other side. They had to get to their children. And finally, they said, they said, the heck with it. They sort of left everything open. Yes, that's what happened. So the, the decision came from the party at about 5 o'clock in the afternoon, and the press secretary read it on television. And I talked to numerous people who watched this, and they said he was stunned by what he was reading. But he kept reading. And everybody immediately said, what? You know, and they started asking for clarification. And he said, well, I don't have any more clarification. So the word, that was 5 o'clock. And by 11 o'clock that night, for instance, in Potsdam at the Glenica Bridge, where Gary Powers, remember Gary Powers, the U-2 pilot, where he was exchanged, they, two people I interviewed went to the, to the bridge, and the guard said, we don't have passes. 
Because in Germany, you need a pass for everything, right? You need a piece of paper. Come back in the morning, we don't have passes. But there weren't that many people there because that's a sparsely populated area. But in central Berlin, there was one crossing called Bornholmerstrasse, which is right in central Berlin, and people started congregating. And that is the story that I heard, uh, and I believe it's true, without no one knowing officially, that in fact, by 11 o'clock that night, the people were queued up and they said, the party said we can come and go through the wall. And some of the guards said, this is getting really dangerous. They weren't going to shoot people, because most of them didn't want to shoot people under any circumstances. And the people were pressing, and they said, we're just going to open the gates. Because there was no communication, as you say, between the higher command. Uh, the, the officer who guarded the wall that I interviewed, he said, that's right. They gave us no orders. There were no passes to visit West Berlin, just to visit. And he said, there were no passes. And they, the, this was the beginning of the end of the GDR. The government simply withdrew. They did nothing. And by 11 o'clock that night, the wall was open. And by 2 o'clock in the morning, East Berlin was empty and West Berlin was full of people. Other questions? Yes. <laughs> Well, okay, that's, that's really good because that's something the West Germans won't entertain. They thought all East Germans were defective people. They, because the East German Communist Party had tried to create what they call the socialist personality. And I have a discussion with someone in the book about that where he says, this was something that the people of East Germany knew the party was trying to do to them and very few people actually believed all this horse manure. And so many people I talked to said at around the age of 9, 10, 11, they'd be sitting at the dinner table with their parents and they would say, how come my experiences are so different from what the party tells us the truth is? And the parents would say, don't ever tell anyone that. Only talk about that here. It was the beginning of the recognition that there was a difference. Now, to get back to the main part of your question, sociologically, they became East Germans because they talked about solidarity all the time, the sense of community. And the solidarity and community were in opposition to the party, and the party thought, we're being successful, we're creating socialist personalities, when in fact the people felt this sense of solidarity because they were being oppressed by the party. So, is that answering your question or not? It doesn't look like I'm answering your question. So, if they felt oppressed by the party, why did they, why did they miss this? Because they had cultural, interpersonal experiences as East Germans that meant something to them. There was a movie I saw at that time, and the guy turns to the camera in the movie and he says, you know, I never realized I was an East German until my country came to an end because I'm sure not a West German, and that's how most of them felt. I'm definitely not a West German, so I must be an East German, and they discovered these things, like if, you were in, if you're in West, West Germany now and, and, and a woman is attacked by a man, I don't think she can call out and the people will come pouring out of their houses as they would do in East Berlin. I said to this woman, how do you feel about walking around in in Berlin now, this was in 1990 after unification, she said, I wouldn't do it at night now. And back then I never worried about it, thought nothing of it. So there was a valid East German cultural identity. And that's what the West Germans actually could not admit. Because it would mean that there was some legitimacy to that East German state. And they weren't prepared to admit that. Then they would also have to face the fact that they became highly Americanized. If you look at the language, the use of the German language in, in, among West Germans, they say super, they say zupa. That's an American word. They say asshole all the time. 
Uh, the proper way to say, excuse me, is Entschuldigung, but most of them say, sorry. You know, okay. So there are lots of uh, intrusions upon them that they don't even know about that came from the, the influence of the Americans. Yes? Yes, they would. As opposed mm -hmm. to when all that was gone, it's almost like it's almost like what's happening this, at this moment in Cuba. You know. Um, well, yes. Okay. Very good. Thank you. The one person I interviewed, one historian, he studied money. That's what he studied: money in the Middle Ages and how it affected society. And he said. Money is central to a capitalist economy, and it makes people individualistic. Here in the East, there wasn't much to buy, but everything was provided for. No one was, well, the party was rich, but among the people, no one was rich, but no one was going to starve. So people didn't think about money. They thought about watching what they said in public, because there, the government and the Stasi could come after you. But yes, they developed this sense of community even how to criticize the party in secret, okay? So, and they, many of them said to me, since the turn, that's what they called the, the, the unification, the turn, the turn away from socialism toward capitalism, we've lost solidarity because we have to worry about putting bread on the table, having a job, and doing these things that we didn't have to worry about before. Yes? Yes. Right. And we were there, we could be there overnight, but we were there for an afternoon, and so we went to uh, like a restaurant, and the whole meal yeah. might have cost one dollar, yeah, two dollars as an example, yeah. but a cup of coffee would be um, one penny. Yeah. Because if I'm trying to spend this money, yeah. 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 we'd go to the coffee store, and right. we'd find, we had, 20, we had 50 Deutschmark between right. us. Right. You, kept, you would buy these, and finally when we were going through this kind of like a tunnel un, uh, um, under the road to get back to the train station, um, there was this woman, this was in, in East Berlin, selling flowers. Mm -hmm. We bought bouquets of these <laughs> Yeah. Because you would lose the money. Right. So it was just, yeah, so that terribly important. in those days, if you wanted to visit East Germany, East Berlin, you had to convert. And that's one way they got hard currency, because the West German mark was hard currency. And yes, it was hard to spend the money. And that was one of, one of the unknown reasons in the West for why the Berlin Wall was built. Because there was a black market. There were people living in West Berlin who said, let's go over there and eat and buy produce because it's so cheap. And the East Germans decided, we're subsidizing the West Germans, and they also thought the CIA was creating a black market to do this. Plus, there were East Germans beginning to leave the country, there's no doubt. But most, I talked to many people who helped build the Berlin Wall. And they said, I was very happy to help build the Berlin Wall because it was a way to keep the evil of communism out. Only later did I feel trapped within it, in the 80s, 70s and 80s. Hmm? Yes, yeah, the black market, and people coming literally from West Berlin, West Germany, to buy goods and services that would cost significantly more in the West. That's what happened. Yes.
Yeah, see, on the black market, on the black market, Deutsch, German, West German Deutschmarks are dollars. Yeah, and, and on this train trip I mentioned earlier, when I went from Berlin down to Budapest, you walk outside the hotel in Budapest, there are six guys who want to trade currency with you. You got American dollars here, we'll give you all this Hungarian money. And it was very attractive. I think, I think we're done. Thank you so <laughs> very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.